Before we go to a next panel, I just want to do a quick moment of thanks, if I may, um, to the people who made, have made this day possible and made all of this possible. For those of you who are correspondents who have published on Planet Forward, um, you know Kim Osi, who runs the joint, and, and And you, you know Elena, who's in the back, and I don't know if Aaron's in the room, but uh, wave and thank you. Aaron's upstairs. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron Dye. Um, Annalise Palmer, who's worked with many of you, who's in the back. Thanks, Annalise. We have an incredible group of students who work with us, and let me tell you, without the students, we'd all be sunk. Right, Kim? Yes. <laughs> so I want to thank Chambers Miller, Caitlin Evans, Daria Anastasia, and Alina Fayaz for all the work that you've done. And other students who volunteered come through. And by the way, we have interns who join us from, from some of our other schools from time to time. So if you're interested, talk to Kim or one of the folks with a, with a shirt on, a Planet Forward shirt on. Um, we heard Andrea here a moment ago mention creativity and you know, how to take creativity in the process. Part of our title here, right, is creativity and storytelling to save the planet. And creativity comes because it's creativity in lots of different shapes and colors. We heard creativity in the ideas and the sol uh, uh, efforts at solutions. Creativity in the people we bring together and the research we try. Creativity in how we do the storytelling itself. So that's what we're going to talk about now. Um, what is it? Why does it matter? Um, we have tools that help us be more creative. We work closely with Adobe, and one of my favorite storytelling platforms is Adobe Express, because it allows us to do remarkable visual storytelling and use all the tools. This is one of the stories, as you can see, um, that, that is rising tides in DC captured the photographs and the images of the cherry blossoms here. And the cherry blossoms, as you may know, are coming out earlier because of climate change. It's warmer sooner. And we have rising tides. What Adobe Express allows you to do with visual storytelling is mix imagery and video and sound and text and layer them over one another. And you can be, with very little experience, a brilliant visual storyteller. So I just want to call that out, because as we go into this, and by the way, this is by Paul Leone. Paul, where's Paul, right? Who just, who just asked that great question. Um, you know, this is, this is what we're, we're talking about now. So we're going to hear now from three students who brought remarkable creativity to their storytelling. And the conversation will be led by an extraordinary person and someone who's become a great friend of Planet Forward. Um, she now serves on its advisory council, and this is Michelle McCauley. She's a provost at Middlebury College. True confessions, full disclosure, that's where I went, that's where my wife went, two of our kids went there, okay. Um, I have some friends here who went there. Um, and it's a great place. Um, but one of the things that Middlebury is doing now is it's making a very strong statement around sustainability. It has a whole Energy 2028 program where it's moving to fully renewable energy. And you're in Vermont, you're in place. And so these pieces come together. But Michelle is also a remarkable person, scholar, and storyteller herself. Her husband, she and her husband have done environmental cartooning. I like to say to my students, push the envelope and I would actually rather see you fail creatively than succeed conventionally. Give it a try, like really push. So please welcome Michelle McCauley, Micah Scott from Tuskegee University, Joy Reeves from Duke University, and Chris Zatarain from the University of Arizona. Michelle, over to you. Thank you, thank you all. Um, so, and thank you, Frank, for the shout out, Middlebury, and the initiative that you have here in the Alliance. I think it's a great partnership. Um, we're so excited about everything that GW is doing around the environment and sustainability. This is just amazing. And Planet Forward being here today, wow, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I, I told these folks this is really a conversation, and this is not the usual place I am in. I'm usually in a class, so I'm just going to have a conversation, and we're going to see what happens. This point, we talked earlier today, and we really covered, you know, 
we know the science and have known the science for a long time. It really is, to what you said, Frank, it's communication, right? This is our challenge. And communication is not just the facts, although what beautiful data visualizations we saw today and that power in being able to take and help people understand what is a megawatt, what does it mean, but also how do we see the changes in climate over time amazing and creative, but we think about that that touches our, in some sense, our awe and our emotion. And I think that this is what the artists and the creators here that we're going to talk about have done just an exceptional job with today. Um, so as I think about the psychology of understanding and storytelling and really reaching in to kind of what and why, um, I, I'm looking forward to hearing what you think. And I'd like to cue up Micah's piece here, and what I'd just like you to do is to take, we'll just frankly take a moment to be contemplative, and before you start, I want everybody to just look at this. It's amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and Micah, if you could tell us a little bit about your inspiration for this and um, what you hope it inspires, mm -hmm. I would love for you to share. <laughs> I'm happy to share. Um, well, back in February, I went to the Dearborn Henry Ford Motor Company, and there we went to their electric vehicle factory and plant where I saw their electric vehicles, their batteries, and a bunch of things that I really didn't understand, but I knew that carbon emission is bad. <laughs> so, so that's pretty much what I had got from it, but um, that really wasn't what got me in. I mean, of course, we all know Ford Motor Company and exactly what they do, but the fact is that we know Ford Motor Company. I'm familiar, of course, with the idea of Ford Motor Company, you know, Henry Ford, and just their history in general. Like, that's, everybody knows Ford. And from Texas, we all know Ford because of pickup trucks. So, mm -hmm. so I, was, I was very familiar with Ford, but when I was there, there were a lot of things that I didn't recognize. And that's pretty much what I was, you know, okay, um, I don't know too much about this, but I wanted to know uh, more about it. So what it really got me was when we went to the Henry Ford Museum. And there, of course, was cars, 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 cars. But it got really good when I saw somebody that I did recognize and that was George Washington Carver. <laughs> and I tell people all the time, if there's one George Washington that I know well, it's Carver. <laughs> like, he, he's that guy, especially being a student at Tuskegee. We know George Washington Carver, we know him well. He taught at our university for over 50 years. He was a director of uh, agriculture, and he lived there, he died there, he's buried there. Everything is pretty much centered around him, especially being at Tuskegee, the pinnacle of agriculture, and him being the, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, agricultural sciences that ever existed. So when I got there and I seen him, I said, what are you doing here, George? Like, what are you doing here? But then I was like, he's here because of why, why I'm here, you know, about sustainability, and really just to um, disconnect that story. So when I went there and I seen him, it was really full circle for me because um, Henry Ford actually came to Tuskegee to learn about sustainability. And when, when I had seen the poster at the museum, it was basically talking about uh, George Austin Carver and how he basically was there to visit their laboratory for soybeans. I'm like, soybeans? Cool. And then I realized like, that wasn't the full story. Like, that innovation that Ford had wasn't just him visiting, it was him helping, experimenting, and creating that innovation. And one thing that stuck to me was why George Austin Carver didn't work at Ford, why he didn't work with Thomas Edison, who had asked, was because he said that he didn't want to work at these corporations because those um, creditations wouldn't go to his people or uh, himself, but they would go to that. And I saw that when I went there and I said, you know, you know, George Austin Carver was just visiting. No, this guy was out here working. You know, Henry Ford made him a laboratory there. Their friendship went very deep. So that's pretty much what inspired me. It was the fact that I recognized who wasn't recognized, and that was the George Washington Carver. <laughs> and it cre helped me create this mural. Um, We'll probably get into it later, but those pictures are actually from our university archive. We have one of the largest and most historic archives actually partnered with the Smithsonian here, and we have the largest and most completed lynching records of any college university, and we are a national historic site. So a lot of history with that being said, and being in a rural Tuskegee, Alabama, I know soil, I know farming, not too much, but I know there are some really, really big deals. So I created this piece to basically do an ode to George Austin Carver and his contributions to sustainability and also his unique friendship with Henry Ford. And all those intricate detail details are what I also had hand drew. So that's it. Yeah, no, it's amazing. <laughs> and I, I just want to pull out the full circle, right, and the recognition of, of where we all, the history that is built, and also sometimes the history that's 
taken away and not acknowledged, right? And so that friendship with Ford is amazing and wonderful and now celebrating George Washington Carver's view, right? And work and effort that really leads to sustainability. Um, I was going to ask you just for a moment of how you decided your kind of, what your process was for the composition of where you chose and how you chose to, to set this up. <laughs> it was long and art for me, it, it kind of, I don't want to say there's a con ever consistent time period because sometimes it takes two weeks, sometimes it takes a day, it really just depends. But with this one, there was so many details and such a story that I had to capture because we have archive with so many pictures, so many actual letters. And I think that was also a hard part is the fact that I was working with the archives with the pictures. So there's a lot more that I could have had, but because they're constantly preserving certain things like the actual letters they had, I couldn't get them because they were um, restoring them. So I was like, man, I got to settle with pictures. <laughs> pictures are great. That's cool. But, <laughs> but um, my first part was actually drawing. Drawing, it was the, the funnest part, but the hardest part. And I remember the first thing I drew was a peanut, you know, because George Carver is known for peanuts. And when I was showing everybody, they was like, um, I was like, what does it look like to you? They were like, they were thinking big, like, mm, it symbolizes the economic state of the world right now. I'm just like, <laughs> try again. <laughs> and they're like, it's a peanut. I said, always go simple. It's a peanut. It's just a peanut. Then I put wheels on. I said, it's a peanut car. And that was, <laughs> that was just my ongoing bit about just like George Washington Carver. People know him as the peanut guy, you know? So that was the first thing I did. So I did all that. Then I scanned it because I'm like, I'm not cutting up these masterpieces. So I scanned it. I cut all of everything up. And then I got the pictures um, from the uh, archives and their reservoir. Res <laughs> Forgive me if I'm saying it wrong. But, um, I got the pictures and it was just this idea of placing it first. So before I had glued anything down, it was putting things strategically and making sure that it told some type of intricate story um, of George Washington Carver. And then I also have like tidbits of newspaper articles about him being the foremost uh, scientist just in the world and just his contributions. And then some actual pictures of him doing art. I thought that was beautiful too because not only is he a scientist, he's a creative. So he was painting and knitting and I also incorporated that because, you know, science is also art, you know. <laughs> so I Absolutely. Put it in there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. No problem. Science is art always, right? All right. I lean that way. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Well, Joy, we're gonna we're gonna bounce to a very different type of medium. Can we give up Joy's work? <laughs> yes. And I am. Um, so I'm gonna offer the same question to you, which is a little bit of what inspired you here, and then also cartooning, as we share, right? It. it People don't always understand what you're trying to do with cartooning. So can you t tell us a little bit about your inspiration for this and your process? Definitely. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Micah. That was yeah. wonderful. Um, yeah, so I'm Joy. I'm a graduating Master of Environmental Management student at Duke University, and I'm also a climate cartoonist, so I'm thrilled to be on this panel with you, Michelle. Um, and I've, I've grown up making comics for a very long time, and I do think there's always been this stigma around comics that they are frivolous, pop culture items at best. Um, but I've really found that comics are a way to hybridize text and visuals in a way that instantly engages people and can really inspire change. I've seen it happen. I've seen how loud comics and zines can be in the activism space. Um, so for my piece, I wrote about um, the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network um, in the state where I go to school. I've worked with them in the past and they started a project that actually empowers local community members to collect spider webs and use them to monitor air pollution in their neighborhoods, um, especially where federal monitoring falls short in a lot of cases. Um, and so I created a comic over the course of several days um, with a few weeks prior of research and asking questions about these spider parties or spider hunts as they're called. Um, and it's really incredible. You have days where families go out and have a potluck together, hunt for spider webs, learn about what pollution is happening in their communities, where it's coming from. Um, and I thought it lended itself quite naturally to a comic. Um, and yeah, if you have the chance to read it, it's about eight pages and it's up on the Planet Forward website. It was an absolute pleasure to create. Thank you. Um, one of the things, so, my husband and I do a comic called Hurry Up, Please, It's Time. You hurry up, please, it's time comic. And I think the hurry up, please makes sense from where we're at. Um, and sometimes we would go to Comic-Con's early days, which was not the right fit for a science comic, by the way. <laughs> but once we were there with someone who had a uh, 
basically zombies on both sides of us, and a little child came up to our comic and was coming towards, and the father said, no, no, don't go there, that's, that's not for us. And so your point on thinking about how do you take these and bring people in in a way that's, not, that, that's approachable and not emotionally polarizing, I think is really cool, and using the webs is just brilliant. So I think we'll all check that out. Let's, let's go a little bit to Chris. And Chris, you are now a completely different modality here in art and mm -hmm. creative, where you're bringing in music and vision. And can we cue this up? And then we're going to come back to all of these. Can we, and we'll listen. <laughs> the three large cisterns on the property, long dry, grown, waiting to be fed. And we're all looking forward to the extra water. I see Pequeño crouching outside through the window. <laughs> I watch him sneak one, two tiny tomatoes from under the black shade cloth. Wild chiapas, blushing sunset from viney bushes. Mi hijo, protector of seedlings, how I see myself in you. I too found peace among plants in a world on fire. <laughs> and so how, how long is this piece? So the piece runs for about 12-ish minutes. Um, it is three short stories. I wanted to take segments of, and, and this is climate fiction, of course. This is, um, I wanted to tell three different perspectives, people living in different areas of the, of the place I'm from, which is, sorry, which is um, Tucson, Arizona. And um, I really wanted to, and you know, that means that each character only gets about like three minutes or so. So I have to be really, you know, deliberate with what I'm trying to convey about that person's, you know, existence and, and their life and what that might look like. So um, this is not your first uh, venture into this modality of the multimedia. Right. I'm, I'm a little bit of an experimental artist. Um, my background is in Western classical music. I'm an oboe player. Um, some of you might remember I performed on this stage last year, um, right after lunch. It was, it was a good time. Um, <laughs> so, you know, but I'm also, I consider myself a multimodal artist as it is. I'm also a still photographer. I grew up doing visual arts and I'm very, I'm very involved in in the art scene in Tucson and at my school. And uh, collaboration is another big part of that. When I can't do something, usually I want to find somebody who can. And so this piece, for example, originally I was going to do it all myself. But instead, I decided to, to call up a friend, um, my friend Jacqueline Arias. Uh, she's doing an MFA right now. And she did the visuals. I did the sound. I did the story. And um, you know, so when you can't do everything, definitely you know, involve your friends. Call up people who do things that you that you admire and that you respect, and you can create something really dynamic and beautiful in that way. Yeah. Right. And, and in community, I think one of the things that I've, that all three of you touched on really is this importance of people having a chance to come together and discuss or think about this, and that belonging really can help motivate and help people stay engaged with. These, these challenging issues. Mm -hmm. So what are you, um, one of the things I said that I would ask would be kind of what are you thinking about your next artistic steps and we're just gonna go backwards this way, I think. Yeah, so I was actually talking to my collaborator, Jackie, and we were, we were thinking about this process and creating this as like a, a sort of template that might be reproducible, um, not even just where we're from, but elsewhere working with people. What I will say is I think I would like to expand on this and involve more voices because a lot of this piece is is my understandings of my home and the science and you know a lot of it was inspired by this book that I read, um, A Great Airedness by William DeBise that is dark and it's terrifying and um, really moving in that way also. So this was all my worldview that shaped these stories, shaped um, this world that I crafted. And so I think, you know, especially with, right now I'm studying arts-based research and thinking about participatory ways of engaging with art. And I would actually really love to expand on this type of project by interviewing people, seeing what they value, what they want to see, what they think will happen. You know, because this isn't prophecy, the future, we're, we're currently crafting it now. And so I think, you know, to involve other people and to hear what their fears are, to hear what they would like to see, um, what they wouldn't like to see in the world at that point, I think could be really valuable and uh, a beautiful thing. 
Thank you. Yeah. Current, we are currently crafting it. Yeah. That is right. That is right. Yeah. Um, so in the past, my cartooning has often been in collaboration with wonderful groups like the National Science Foundation, the Center for Transformative Teaching and Learning, and even a rare Stan Lee shout out, may he rest in peace. Um, and I think uh, what I'm looking to do is to keep collaborating with scientists and policymakers on cartoons. It's really such a democratizing way of presenting good climate science um, and climate policy. So. I uh, will be coming out, my comic will be part of a climate mental health journal that's coming out in May. Not the spider comic, but a different one that I would love to share with all of you. And then I'm also going to explore the medium of the Instagram for panel comic using humor to engage people. I've really seen some success there. Um, I haven't launched the platform yet, but you may have seen on the slide at the climate cartoonist is going to be launching shortly. And I'm very excited to explore that medium and use some humor. Thank you. Yeah. And yes, ma'am. Um, similar to Joy, um, I'm really interested in creating or combining advocacy through creativity. I'm a political science and English major, so communicating through art or language in just general is just always what I've done. It's always what I wanted to continue to do. Um, yeah, that's pretty much my plans for the future is to just combine my artistic craft with um, with politics and with writing, because I feel like art has always been political. Even with this piece, it's, it was called the Peanut Gallery. I forgot to mention that, <laughs> it's, which is like obviously, obvious, like you know, art gallery. But of course, the play on George Carver and Peanut. But also, just shout out to Tuskegee because we're we're a rowdy bunch. We're loud, and I feel like some disturbances are necessary. Like even social disturbances, like reaching out and just saying like, hey, you know, the show not can go on until we say what we're gonna say. So <laughs> it's a double entendre of both, you know the art gallery, but also Tuskegee and Jordan Carver. So I just want to keep merging the bridge between HBCU and uh, black stories and representation into, I don't want to say mainstream media, but just the eyes of everybody, because stories like ours shouldn't be unrecognized. George Washington Carver should not be unrecognized. He's not just the peanut man. He's that guy. <laughs> so I want stories like this to be told in a way that it reaches every stage to the point where it's not just you know black history, but history that everybody is fundamentally aware of. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to pull in my psychology for a moment. And one of the, so part of the area that when I teach, if you talk about how the climate is restorative to us and also the importance of finding ways to stay, to sustain your efforts and your engagement in this work. We talked earlier about doom and gloom and the, you know, doom, bloom soon in some ways is absolutely real. And in also may not really motivate people to get out there. It's hard not to just go into yourself, kind of like a little crab. And so how do you stay out? And I'd like to know, as artists, sometimes, uh, I, I do live with two artists who, who identify fully in that way, and it's very, the art itself can be sustaining, but what other things? How are you doing this type of social justice work, environmental work? How are you taking care of yourself? So, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I do identify as an artist, and a lot of my self-care, a lot of my nourishing comes from art. I, I like to engage with, with um, the, the artwork of other people and also nature and, and just being a part of that and trying to take inspiration. You know, I live in a really beautiful place um, for most of the year, or part of the year anyway. Um, and just just kind of becoming the small self a little bit and thinking about the greater world and all of the, the, the different things that are out there is, is humbling and it, it is, it is nour nourishing in a lot of ways. But, um, you know, and in my process, like through, through this piece that I made, I'm not afraid to go into darker places. I'm not afraid to look at grief. I'm not afraid to look at sorrow and, and you know, and hope and all of these other, uh, these other um, emotions. And so I think, you know, and that's part of my process is I have to go to these places in order to um, untangle them and to dissect them. And that allows me to gain a new perspective and to move on in some ways and to, to move on to the next thing and think about my world differently. Yeah. Joy. Um, yeah, this is such a tricky question because I think one of the keys to storytelling, regardless of what your medium is, is to put yourself in your audience's shoes be I, like I would be Joy Reeves and I open my phone and I start scrolling what story is gonna hook me 
what, what, what hook is really gonna like latch onto my brain? And when we create art for self-care, I think sometimes that focus intrudes upon the, the self-care of the art. Um, so if I'm painting just to paint with no audience, um, no motivation, um, it, it's, it's really difficult to not be thinking about the art as a product. Um, and so I think the secret to taking care of yourself as a creator is to um, find a community um, of people who are willing to create just for the sake of creating with you. Um, when I was a junior in college, I formed a what was essentially an art club, but I branded it as the guild so that people would join it. <laughs> and we had an amazing time doing exactly that, just creating for the sake of it. Um, and I think it helped us all heal. I want to say for me, the first step was really just identifying myself as a creative to the point where it's just what I exude. Like, I'm a creative person. I love art in every medium. Like, that's just who I am as a person. And I think in terms of self-care, art art always been self-care to me. And I know for a lot of times with the doom and gloom, for some reason, people automatically go into the deep end when it comes to art. So even when I did my piece, they were like, oh, it's, I'm just like, you're thinking too much. It's a peanut right now. <laughs> so so people, people are going to do that. So I think a lot of times you have to remind them, like, nah, no, this is, this is a joyous piece. This is something that I'm happy about because I was happy doing it. So finding that fulfillment in art is pretty much the greatest place to be happy and the greatest way to be happy. And when it came to forward, not thinking of it as a brand, because at first I was thinking about marketability and market, I mean, the, you know, marketing archetype of what they go with innovation, sustainability, and forward strong. Like, those models were in my head, and I was just like, for what? <laughs> like, I know for what, because I'm here, but like, once I disassociated myself with responsibility to present myself the way that they, they would, I was able to freely, freely create and find my way back home to the ski and create what I did, so. Lovely. And I think all of you really touched on that awe, and awe is something that just will inspire and connect. So thank you all so much. Can I hang around with these amazing creators? You guys are great. Thank you very much. That was tremendous. Michelle, before you leave, I mean, just steal you for a second. I, I think Imani's going to rejoin us. But I, I should point out, um, that you direct the whoops that you direct the conservation psychology lab uh, at Middlebury, where you look at sort of um, pro environmental attitudes, behaviors, where they come from, yes, and connect life experience of nature and psychological need uh, fulfillment. I think you call it right. Psychological need fulfillment. Yes. To, With, yes. To, to encourage pro environmental behaviors, right? And yes. Look at that. So. As storytellers or anything yes, else, yeah. how do we encourage yeah. this kind of behavior? Well, uh, so you know, there's a big disconnect between attitudes and behaviors. We're not surprised on that. It's very easy to click "I care." It's much more difficult to take the next step. We talked earlier about that need to both present the problem, but then have two thirds be on what the solutions are. Uh, this is very, very helpful. Um, I do this work with two behavioral economists, by the way, uh, as we think about both psychology and motivation through that realm. I would say very quickly, it's belonging. So bringing in and reminding people you're part of a larger group working together on this helps to get action and making clear what you want people to do. Right? Give but not them, necessarily telling them what you to do. Do, you, do not tell them. If, well, very precarious to tell people what to do, right? You end up getting polarization or I make a, you're taking their autonomy in that sense. So when we talk about uh, self-determination theory and basic psychological needs, a large one, and this differs a little person to person, but a large one is that, that volition, that control, I have autonomy, and yes. So we want to show the possibilities of different ways, and we want to bring all voices in for the belonging so we can work. This is, this is interdisciplinary, and it will take all of us, and it will take all of us working. And for those of you who are students, it's not fair. I, I do start classes with this where we're at. It's not fair, that's not the point. The point is this is the challenge of our time, folks, and we all have to be here in it now. Thank you, so, Michelle. That's thank awesome. you, and don't slip. That's all right. <laughs>